the uh, new secretary of the Smithsonian, uh, who comes to us building on a distinguished career in medicine as a cardiologist, uh, and president uh, in academia of University of Iowa and of Cornell. Uh, but he's been, uh, he was appointed as the 13th secretary uh, beginning this past summer. And I can say that as, uh, as an artist who visited the museums uh, since a child uh, on, on the mall, uh, an endless source of inspiration is at your disposal. Uh, and also a tremendous source of work. Uh, I'm proud to serve on the President's Committee for Arts and Humanities, uh, along with others in this room, uh, Jill Cooper Udall and our co-chair George Stevens, uh, Jr. is here. Uh, and one of the earliest things we did was partner with Richard Curran. And, uh, uh, and uh, Michelle, George, and Liz, nice to see you all here too. And uh, I asked uh, earlier whether I should call you, you know, Dr. Scorton or President Scorton or Professor Scorton or Secretary Scorton. Um, everyone here can call me David, but Walter, I'd like you to call me Your Excellency. Your Excellency. <laughs> That, by the way, was a Henry Kissinger line when he became, they said, should we call you Mr. Secretary or Dr. Secretary? He said, Your Excellency will do. Uh, in your case, it actually fit, and I've heard about it. You gave a wonderful speech about this is magic in, so, in some ways, uh, but you also allowed Wenton to play Louis Armstrong's horn for it. So tell me about the inauguration and the idea that this is magic. Well, uh, the official title of it, uh let me interrupt myself. Uh, I want to thank you, Damien, for uh, your kind words. Uh, Damien's a fellow flute player. You, perhaps you didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And if you're, a, uh, if you're an aficionado of these conferences, I wouldn't let another one go by uh -huh. without forcing Damien to show, show his stuff. But that's up to you, really, as a group. Um, but it's wonderful to, wonderful to be here, and thank you. And I do want to acknowledge my, um, my partner, and a person who's taught me so much about the Smithsonian, Richard Kieran, hey, who's a um, source of a lot of our very good ideas, which um, henceforth are going to be considered my ideas. But I just <laughs> I wanted to just mention it today. So the installation, which my colleagues are calling the imposition mm -hmm. uh, at the Smithsonian, um, I wanted to set the stage that um, the currency we deal in, just as you said, Damien, is inspiration. The currency that we deal in, uh, how we deal the currency, I'd like to talk about if, if we have time. But that's what we deal in, is uh, inspiration. Inspiring people to understand more things, to dream bigger, to make things, to create things, to understand things. And so the word I used as magic is to meant to reflect the many different ways that we can bring that together. Some of that is based on being face to face, so to speak, with an object, a painting, something that has historical significance. But increasingly, it has to do with the dynamic interplay of ideas and the content. The speech is available, and if you have trouble sleeping, and, and who doesn't <laughs> these days, if you read this speech, I guarantee you, you will fall asleep quickly. You'll stay asleep for six to eight hours and awake with no bitter aftertaste or anything <laughs> like that. So try it out. Well, you talk about being in the presence of an object and whether it's Louis Armstrong's horn or mm -hmm. Betsy Ross's flag or whatever, you can see all those things digitally online now. Where does the museum of the future go in the digital age? So first of all, uh, as, as you know, uh, but you're too nice to say, uh, I really don't know much about the museum world. Uh, I come from a career lifetime spent in the life sciences. Uh, I'm a cardiologist. I, took care up to a few months ago of uh, young people, teenagers and young adults with inborn heart disease. So I'm comfortable in that world. I'm a, a amateur musician, avid amateur musician. I'm comfortable in that world. And I'm just learning about the museum world. So uh, that's, that's a sort of a disclaimer. But I'm reading avidly. I'm reading right now three different books on museum studies of various kinds. And very frequently, as you may have noticed, there's articles these days about the so-called 21st century museum. The most recent one I read was uh, four or five days ago in the time, New York Times. And uh, in those uh, articles, there's sort of three themes are sounded. And I want to be clear that I'm not saying these are the three most important themes, but these are the ones that I absorbed. Number one was the idea of that Walter has eloquently raised, uh, the moving from an object-based encounter 
two one where you don't even have to be on site and it could be visual or it could be auditory, it could be some other way that doesn't require being in front of the object. I believe right now from my own experience just as a museum goer and a few weeks at the Smithsonian, a few months at the Smithsonian, that institutions like the Smithsonian that are large, broad, well-known, and I'd like to say respected, will for the foreseeable future should and will have a foot in both worlds. That we need to preserve the objects that we recognize as part of the American tradition and international tradition and culture. And yet, as Richard and others have been doing there for some time, begin to push the boundaries of what uh, President of Georgia Tech and a very creative person began the process of more aggressively digitizing those parts of the collection that can easily be digitized. The collection, breathtakingly, is 138 million things. Mm -hmm. And some of the museums, uh, I believe Freer Sackler, the entire collection is digitized, and there's some others. But uh, he, the verb he used, Walter, was to democratize the Smithsonian's collection. So you don't have to be among the relatively small number of people worldwide who will ever get to the mall. Unfortunately, even in our fair city, there are people who don't get to the mall, who don't really share in the riches directly. So that's one, one, one theme that sounded. A second theme that sounded, which resonates with me and that I'm very concerned about, is the issue of diversity writ large. And that is diversity in the audiences we are serving, diversity in the employment, the workforce of the museums, diversity in the programming that we offer to whomever may want to touch it, diversity in the themes that we're willing to touch. And if you want to, I wouldn't mind coming back to controversy later as, mm -hmm. as one of those things related to diversity. So that's the second theme that sounded. And the third one uh, really has to do with an underlying issue that I think our society is dealing with, and that is how to focus on the so-called STEM disciplines. The fact that we think about it in vocational terms, in economic terms, in world leadership terms, in security terms, all of that's important, necessary, but not sufficient to work our way through a troubled world. Well, you seem suited for that because you have a science background as a cardiologist, uh, and yet even in your cardiology, renowned for arts. So instead of seeing things as the arts or the STEM disciplines, you actually have stood at the intersection. Is there a way to make sure that people can get to that combination of the two uh, cultures? Well, uh, I, I'm a cheerleader for that. I'm not an expert in making it happen. Uh, without meaning to pander, what you do collectively at the Aspen is a great example of bringing people, ideas, mm -hmm. points of view, even differing points of view, perhaps especially differing points of view together. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my partners and colleagues at the Smithsonian, like Richard but not limited to Richard, have done a fabulous job of doing this across different disciplines. But I think we could do a lot more and um, we're doing some reorganizations now that we're still in the midst of that I hope will sort of set the infra infrastructural stage to make it a bit easier within the Smithsonian to think yeah. across those lines. So like at Cornell where things are less in divisions and departments, you've gone cross-divisional, you're doing that with some of the big ideas, whether it's climate change or societies and culture at the Smithsonian. Yeah, trying to, when, when you have a venerable institution that's been around for a very long time, and, uh, and the Smithsonian is one of those, Cornell is one of those, the only sure way to do something that's really different is to be able to turn the page on a new chapter. Now, uh, when, uh, when Lonnie Bunch, uh, uh, our wonderful director of the soon to be open National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is beautiful and profound, both, yeah. um, he is going to turn the page on a chapter that started as a blank slate. A long, long overdue exploration of African American history and culture in this country that we sorely need. So he's going to do some very interesting things that I think you'll find fascinating and will deal exactly with what you're talking about. That museum will touch history, culture, it'll touch science, it'll touch almost everything you're talking about. But as hard as that's been to do, it's easier than taking something that's been in existence for 50 or 100 years and turning it. And at Cornell, the best uh, opportunity I had, and I was just the recipient of an opportunity, I don't get any special credit for it, is the new campus that's being built on Roosevelt Island was such a blank slate where Michael Bloomberg, then mayor, as you know, of New York, 
And our chairman, Bob Steele, was in on that process. Bob Steele, was, Bob Steele and Seth Pinsky were the people who actually put it together. Bob was then the deputy mayor for economic development. And Seth Pinsky at the time was the president of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And their idea was they analyzed the economy of New York City, one of the largest economies in the world, even of countries. And they discovered that although the prediction was that finance, media, fashion, mm -hmm biomedical uh, studies and so on would always be a part of the New York economy, that in the tech sector there was a relative shortage of graduate trained <coughs> tech uh, professionals, that is computer scientists, mm -hmm. electrical engineers, uh, material scientists. And so they had a contest which we partnered with uh, Technion, Israel Institute of Technology and won, and it was a blank slate. So that campus is being put together with no departments, no departments. And so what we set up were what we called hubs, for lack of a more elegant term, three areas that seemed to fit the New York City economy that we could bring together strands from different disciplines to create a new kind of fabric. And those three were healthy living, the built environment, uh, <coughs> thought about broadly, including transportation infrastructure and green tech and so on, and then the media, so-called connective media. But short of turning a page and having a blank slate, mm -hmm. it's a tall order because places like the Smithsonian or universities got to be distinguished because the disciplines were excellent. And so if we abandon a focus on supporting the individual disciplines for excellence, we're going to get nowhere by combining them. And so where we can do new things like we're doing with African American, we can create it out of whole cloth. Otherwise, it's a delicate organism. Mm -hmm. And where we have to handle it at all, it has to be handled very, very gently and carefully. And I'm a strong believer that it has to be bottoms up. Mm -hmm. That even if I had been 20 years in the museum business, it's not for the top leader of a very complex organization with 6,500 employees and a like number of volunteers to have one person pound the table and say, now you're going to work together. It has to come from the grassroots up. And um, I hope I'll be able to foster You mentioned a moment ago the importance of having younger people, youth, and diversity be part of defining the museum of the future. How are you going to do that? When you look at me and you say younger, why don't you say even younger? Even younger. You say? It's, uh, it's very, your whole attitude is extremely upsetting. It really is. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's your round table, so I'll let it go this time. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, from being in higher ed for so long and interacting with, uh, with undergraduates and my, my wife, who, who really is the source of uh, the very large proportion of my good ideas, had the idea years ago that we should live with the freshmen in a freshman dorm each fall at Cornell, which we did. Yeah, that sounds like something that I would not have considered a good idea. Well, um, the, the, latest thing, uh, the latest thing she's talking about now is having us stay like a good idea. Yeah, you think it's a cool idea, but those floors are marble. And so, uh, but forgetting my age and back. Um, so, uh, so when you think about, uh, about the higher ed experience, um, I always thought that our ideas about some aspects of academia could not depend on an audience response. If one is teaching uh, current events or civics or biography or poems or poetry or dance or whatever it is, we have experts, professionals who do that, and they interact with students, and they get feedback, and so on. But other aspects, like the way we do the things, mm -hmm. should have consumer input, or whatever the right word is. And so I want to emphasize some more public input into how we do our planning. And specifically, uh, we're going to set up a youth advisory council here in the city of Washington. I've had the uh, wonderful experience of talking to Mayor Bowser about it. She was very nice to let me come in, spend time with her at a busy time in the city's life. She endorsed the idea. We're going to work on it together. And we hope to bring students, <coughs> perhaps uh, freshmen, sophomores, we're still, still thinking it through, from all over the, uh, the, the D.C. area, and, um, and show them some things that we're thinking about. Now, in, in the case of people who preceded me as leaders in the Smithsonian, like Richard and others, They've already done a lot of that kind of stuff. In the National Museum of Natural History, when you first enter on the Constitution Avenue side, if you go right in and turn to the right, there's something called Curious, Q-R-I-U-S. It's oriented toward teens. It was designed in part by Washington high school students. Hmm. It's fantastic. And there's an art lab uh, attached to the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden which deals, if I get this right, with uh, kids from about age 13 to 19. They don't even have to be students. 
and they're in there learning how to do everything from, I was in there a couple days ago, uh, stage lighting to uh, DJ work to uh, post-production music to sketching, y you name it. So there already are some already are some youth programs, but I need the input as the as the mm -hmm. new leader. And so we're going to set up this youth council, and I'm going to listen to them. And to the extent that they can spend the time with me, allow the other leaders a chance to try ideas out on them and see what they think. Now we can't just you can't have your customer tell you exactly what to do. I'm reminded of mm -hmm. Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma, yeah. where uh, one of the many interesting ideas in that book that I remember so clearly. Uh, was that you want to listen to your customers, but you can't run your company based on what your customers. Right. You may have to tell them what they need and convince them that, that they need it. That was an old Steve Jobs line. Really? Yeah. 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 Henry Ford said, uh, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking about whether I have a faster horse. You know, my, my first car in 1965, when most of your parents were learning how to walk, uh, was an Impala. Oh, yeah. And Chevy. I, and guess what? I just got a new Impala. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> Chevrolet will be happy. And, uh, and it's a it's a it's a fabulous car. You know, and we've talked about. It. I know Raj Venicata is here, and um, uh, also Damien and you and I have talked about uh, around the country getting because we're starting a new division here at the institute for uh, people who are in high school in early years of college, especially from less served communities, getting them involved in all sorts of programs, and we're going to be working with you on that, I hope. So yeah. it'll be good. You mentioned earlier two controversies, and would you like, Smithsonian seems to either uh, stumble or done that. Um, tell us your view of some of the controversies that have had and how you propose to handle them. I, I'd love to talk about that. Uh, the one thing I won't do is I won't second guess decisions made before I got there. It's very hard to do that. But um, let's talk about the general proposition. And to me, the general proposition is that creative activity will very often engender controversy. And science is something I'm most comfortable with, Walter. Mm -hmm. Somebody has a new theoretical to people in the field is going to be very controversial for two sets of reasons. One reason is that it's an actual new idea. The other one is it steps on people's conceptions of what they spent their whole careers on. So in science, we're used to having actual arguments. I mean, heated arguments over points of view. And you know a lot about this because the people, the innovators about whom you, you, you've written. But it's also equally true of the arts. So if we think about contemporary art, which in every generation is whatever's happening now, I believe that artists, whatever kind of artists they are, they could be dancers, they could be musicians, they could be performing artists of other types or visual artists, may perceive the world a bit differently. They may perceive trends sooner than the general populace perceives trends. And so when creating an expression mm -hmm. that reflects that different perception of currency, of reality, they may bump into people who don't mm -hmm. share that point of view. Years go by or generations go by, and perhaps that was an early perception of something that actually turned out to be true, maybe not. But whatever it is, creative activity across the spectrum of human activity will engender controversy. So we have to be ready for it. And I think the few axioms to me would be if a professional, a curator, uh, backed by normal institutional processes done correctly, decides to put something up, we should not take it down. Sanger's bust in the National Portrait Gallery. And uh, in that particular case, I could not be more supportive of the decision of the director of the National Portrait Gallery, Kim Sayet, and the undersecretary, Richard Curran, that, that we have to tell the story of our country, both the parts that we're very proud of and the parts that we shake our heads about, perhaps, and wonder. Because otherwise, how are we going to understand and think more toward the future? So it doesn't mean we have to be arrogant. It doesn't mean that we can't improve processes, that we can't think more actively in a preemptive way about what might be controversial and think have about Have you it. had an example of that that you've had to face already, leaving aside Margaret Sanger? Well, the Bill Cosby uh, supported uh, exhibit in the National Museum of African Art. I'm also very supportive of the director there, uh, Jeanetta Cole. Jeanetta Cole, like myself, uh, has been a president of two colleges in the past, which I think Help. basically means that and everything she says is probably right. But anyway, uh, I, think that, I think that it was very, very important to understand the reasons for that exhibit and not to punish the artists 
and not to punish those who would like to pursue it because of problems uh, or potential problems with, with the way the collector. So you haven't walked that back. And won't. And okay, won't walk it back. Good. And you speak of uh, half jokingly of having run colleges like uh, uh, Dr. Cole did and you did uh, as being preparation. There is a lot of discussion these days about political correctness mm -hmm. on college campuses mm -hmm. causing controversies or trying to stop people from doing things. What did you learn at Cornell from that issue that you're applying to the Smithsonian? Well, I haven't had to apply too much to the Smithsonian in 16 weeks, just basically understanding where the entrances are and, and so on. But uh, well, You had the Bill Cosby issue. Well, yeah. Um, which is a college campus issue as well. It is. It is. Um, I, I learned a lot of lessons. Uh, my point of view about controversies is that the leader has to get out in front of it and face them. Mm -hmm. uh, my approach to student protests was to go and talk to the students. They didn't always want to talk to me. They weren't always interested in what I had to say, but I wanted to make the offer. And um, it's important, at least it was important for me, uh, to leave my ego at the door. Not to but, but the issue of political correctness. Well, I'm, I'm going okay, to yeah, yeah. get there. This is like a paragraph, not a sentence. Okay, sorry. I'll get there. You know how that works. You're too much of an editor, see? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so here's the thing about political correctness. Political correctness is one way of looking at the world. One way of looking at the world. We call it political correctness in a pejorative sense. But let's say uh, when we began to use gender neutral language, I think it's very important to use gender-neutral mm -hmm. language because it reminds us to think about the world as beyond uh, people who look like you and me, mm -hmm. as good-looking as we, as we yep. do. Um, <laughs> and so I think there's a place to think about those things. But when you use the term political correctness in a pejorative sense, what you mean is limiting expression, limiting expression, putting a boundary on expression if it doesn't fit a certain mold, which has to be avoided, which has to be avoided. So I think bringing a, a, a world of ideas together, once again, as Aspen does so well, is important. And maybe leaders like you and I have to make an extra effort to bring in ideas that make our own blood boil, right. to make sure that we, too, are not self-selecting for things that we're most comfortable with. And so one of the things I love already about the Smithsonian is that, and I don't mean this to sound facetious, even though it may, is that I don't want people to think like they have to defer to me on opinions like that. I'm there at their service, like I was at the university, to make sure that a thousand flowers can bloom. And when a thousand flowers bloom, someone's going to sneeze. Something else is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just the way, that's just the nature of the beast. Hmm. Let me open it up, if I may. Um, questions? Um, lean I'm forward. a licensed physician, so if you have yes, any personal right. issues. Yes, right. Michonne, go ahead. You first. And yes, okay. I got okay, it. I'm there Michelle go, Boston. I just want to say uh, my family has enjoyed the Smithsonian for multiple generations. It was the place where we completed our educations, hmm. basically. I have a question about the Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. I visited uh, the museum recently with some distinguished guests, family group, and I hadn't been in there for a while, and I've noticed some of the changes, but I felt it still as a museum for the 21st century, it wasn't dynamic enough. Mm -hmm. In fact, I made a comment saying I liked it better when it was creepy looking. <laughs> All that to say, since the Smithsonian has always served as an institution where sciences, but I wasn't feeling that. Can you tell us more about what, what the plans are for natural history? Yeah, it's so, uh, thanks for asking the question. It's such important input to get from you. You've been uh, uh, a devoted follower of the museum, so your opinion means a lot. Um, I was at the meeting of their board this morning, as a matter of fact, looking at the plans of the director, Kirk Johnson. And when I mentioned earlier, can I call you Michonne? Is that all right? You can call me Dr. Your Excellency, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, when I talked before about the Smithsonian having, and I believe for the future should have, one foot in the world of things that maybe don't seem so dynamic and exciting, but still a portion of the populace wants to be there face to face interactive and so on. That museum is going to be, if Richard would agree, an exemplar of that. That curious teen-oriented thing is in that museum. And you might not wander in there directly if, you weren't, if you're not in that age group, but, but they're making an attempt to make things more dynamic while not giving up the enormity of that. Most of the collection of the Smithsonian is actually attributed to that museum, 126 million out of the 138 million biological specimens and all kinds of things. So they're dealing with a, a pretty heavy lift, and that is not to give up the attention 
of the intention, excuse me, to preserve those and preserve them, not just for the sake of saying they're preserved, but to make them available for scholars. A new question comes up in anthropology, paleontology, <laughs> and how wonderful it is to be able to go back and look at something that's there because it's been preserved carefully and yet appealing to a broader and broader populace by making it more dynamic and interactive. They are in the direction of doing that without giving up the former. So stay tuned. If you had time yourself to go in and look at Curious and you had time to write me a note about it, I'd love to see your reaction if you think that's going in the direction you're talking about. Because again, as I mentioned, I'm so new to this world that I myself am you know, trying to soak all this up. But I think you'd find that it is going in that direction. And by the way, across, even though you didn't ask it, if, if I may, if you go to the uh, Cooper Hewitt, uh, the National Design Museum, which is a Smithsonian institution in New York City at, um, I think it's 91st and 5th, you'll find a very dynamic uh, approach there using a, a digital pen where you can go around and touch a little spot on a sign by an object and you get to collect a digital image of that object in your own collection. And uh, it's fascinating. So across the whole institution, there's an enormous movement in that direction. And in each unit, it does, but, but variable depending on the subject. And the Cooper Hewitt just reopened, right? Reopened, uh, I guess, uh, six months ago, yeah. something. December, yeah, a, yeah, almost a year ago. And you have uh, the museum that's being done. Right? The Renwick. Renwick. What's happening there? It's going to, the ribbon cutting, I think, is a week from tomorrow, maybe. And uh, oh, you all are invited. Yeah. Yeah, you really are. And uh, we're having some parties ahead of time that you're not invited to, but that's all right. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's, that's going to be a very, and very, it will very, be diff very different experience. Uh, I'm not going to steal her thunder okay. by, because you want to put it on, uh, you know, C SPAN or something. So <laughs> okay. you'll like we'll it. We'll have though. to show up, Sonny. You'll like it. Um, My I'll friend. Also be for, for your excellency. <laughs> Thank you. Washington native. I actually worked at the Smithsonian. Uh, oh, Smithsonian my goodness. Associates in American History and actually worked here uh, at the Aspen Institute. Thank as well. you. I'm executive director of the DC Jazz Festival. Hmm. We just met with American History and I'll show, introduce my chairman, Conrad Kenley. Uh, uh, festival. Thank you, Conrad. And I was excited when I did the walkthrough of American History to just see. Uh, the innovative experiences that are happening over there. And I think that really speaks to what you're, you're talking about, 21st century digital learning. So I want to thank you. Uh, and I know you can take the credit for being on board 16 weeks, but uh, it's a wonderful place now. And we thank actually you. look forward to doing something uh, very exciting and innovative with uh, uh, the jazz department, the Smithsonian Massachusetts <laughs> Jazz Orchestra. And I know that you're a jazz enthusiast too. So uh, really thank you for Oh, thanks for being so positive. The uh, Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra is very, very impressive. The music director is Charlie Young, who's the head of the jazz program at Howard. And uh, they were, uh, they took pity on me and let me sit in for two numbers at their season opener about three weeks ago, which I didn't tell anybody in case it went south. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> on flute. Uh, on, on flute, yeah. What did you play? Um, we played, it was a Latin jazz concert, and I used to be the producer and DJ on a Latin jazz radio show in Iowa City, <laughs> Iowa. And so uh, I know the literature, so to speak. It doesn't mean I can play it, but I know the literature. And so I sat in on uh, a song, uh, a number called Azulito. Uh, uh, Azo, like in azure, so a little blues. It's a 12-bar blues to a Latin beat. And the other one was an old chestnut, uh, Oye Como Va by Tito Puente. And the original, uh, Oye Como Va was popularized, I, I would say, most by Santana, who recorded it sometime after Tito Puente did and did a certain electronic version, electric version, I should say, which is great. The original Tito Puente recording uh, was a challenging sort of a flute deal. So just because Charlie Young is a excellent and tough taskmaster, he, uh, he assigned that one to me. So that was, that was fun. And my heart rate went down below 200 just a couple days ago. <laughs> doing that. That, that, that orchestra, by the way, is fabulous. And if I want to plug one more thing for American history, the National Museum of American History, for those for whom jazz is not their thing, those unfortunate souls that <laughs> haven't seen the light yet, um, there's also the Chamber Music Society, which has its own, own performing space, which is fabulous because not only are there these unbelievably great musicians, but they're playing the vintage instruments. And it is, uh, I, haven't, I haven't gone to one of the concerts yet, but I've read quite a bit about it. Ken and Sloan. Yeah, amazing. Uh, yeah, Ken Sloan. Yeah. yeah, just amazing. Eleanor, yeah. Thank you. I want to get back to the Museum of the 21st Century okay. and that New York Times article and ruling from the bottom up. 
Uh, my name's Eleanor Fink, and I'm the manager of the American Art Collaborative, which is a consortium of 14 museums that are getting rid of their data silos mm -hmm. so that you can search across the contents of all of them. And three Smithsonian museums are part, American Art, Portrait, to. If someone could go from, let's say, a painting that depicts an invention that happens to be in history and technology to the portrait of that inventor that's at the portrait gallery to maybe something in natural history. Now, technology is there to do that. Mm -hmm. We're doing it in our project. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not so much a matter of money. And you don't have to have everything digitized to start. Mm -hmm. You have to have a will. And I'm afraid of the Smithsonian sometimes to get this kind of collaboration across all the institutions, bottom up won't work because each is thinking of their own. So it, it's such a wonderful opportunity one wouldn't want to pass it up. I mean, how, how can you can instill something for the Museum of the 21st Century? Yeah, well thanks first of all for the question and for caring so much about this and we're proud to be part of that collaborative group when it was set up Betsy Brun. Uh, mm -hmm. um, tiny bit conceptually because we're here. the quote unquote so you can only touch the not way up here in Valhalla like I am and they're not way down there uh, and so I think there is a real will to try to use technology and not just technology Sometimes we get lost everywhere in all our endeavors in doing something with technology just because we can. Mm -hmm. Know where we want to get to. We know the destination and technology will help us get there. Mm -hmm. I believe there's a lot of people talking about that and I, I don't want to sound too Pollyannic. The, the strength of the disciplines that make a place like the Smithsonian what it is requires some inward looking and some protective mechanisms to make sure in a constrained funding environment that all the mouths are fed that have to get the get the, get things out uh, get things done every day. That's a terrible mixed metaphor I just did, but anyway. <laughs> um, but I believe that the uh, people at the level of the directors and the undersecretaries actually want to do this thing. And and why would they want to do it? Because people who have been leading a center of excellence, where people like Michonne will say they've been coming there since they were kids, and so on and so forth, they want to stay relevant. They want to know that the American people and others believe in it and crave it and want to be there. So they really want to, want to make it new and different. But there's also the matter of 18 million people coming there every year for a wide variety of things. Some of them just want to have the old time experience and some want to have new things and some don't know what they want to have. They've never been to a place like that and want to see what it is. So those leaders have the burden, I would call it, the responsibility of having to be there 364 days a year. But instead of responding, happily surprised when you see some of the things come to fruition. And as a person who's done biomedical research for a long time, the only way you get it is belly up for everyone that became At, at, at Cornell, it's Day Hall, named after a previous president to Cornell. They say, well, Day Hall is stopping us from doing yeah. what we want to do, you know. And here it's like the castle is standing in the way of progress. But I think, I think you'll find yeah. that um, from the castle to the desktop of the people uh, uh, cranking it out every day, you'll find a spirit of wanting to push ahead while maintaining the, the, the traditions. And I hope you'll keep in touch with me, Eleanor, and tell me what you think as time goes on. And I'm going to keep track of that collaborative. It's very, very important to have that data in a place where the interoperability will allow us all to touch it. That would be great. Thanks. Um, yeah, Joanne and Jill. Thank you, David. Um, curious about the uh, hierarchical levels that you have and how do you envision feedback coming from the bottom up? I'm aware that uh, Elon Musk likes to have send to him maybe a fresh idea mid-level advisors or managers who get take some umbrage and with saying I'm sure this class here I'll call us a class we're going to be your first sleepover so you can take the list and send in the invitations yeah just yeah. I, just be sure to bring me an air mattress for that for that floor but uh, but here, here's what I've done in the past and you know as they say uh, past behavior is the only predictor of future email 23,000 students 
all 3,000 rest of faculty, all uh, whatever it was, 14,000 other employees. Now, did they all write me every day? Thankfully, no. <laughs> and um, I had those come directly to me. My lieutenants, or whatever you call them, hated when I went in front of a town hall meeting and gave him my email because they said, great, he's only going to forward it to me. <laughs> but nonetheless, I got a lot of feedback. But most people don't want to do that. Why don't they want to do it? They're afraid of retaliation. They're afraid of being embarrassed. They're most afraid of never hearing from you. But that's one thing that I've already done is giving out my email. At the Smithsonian, it's easy. There's a formulaic way the emails are done. The other thing that I believe in is town hall meetings. Now, when you have town hall meetings, there's two kind of town hall meetings. I guess there's three kind. There's the kind where you have the new person, people all want to show up, sort of like going to the NAC. Can they talk? Can they tie their tie or whatever? And we had a pretty good turnout. And there's town hall meetings when there's a problem, when there's an issue. Um, in every organization, if they fall upon hard times financially, if layoffs are looming and so on, and the CEO calls a town hall meeting, people show up. And then there are the, there's no crisis, uh, we already know who this folk, folk is, and um, uh, so on. And I had my first of those third kind of town hall meetings a couple days ago in the National Museum of Natural History. And we had, uh, I, I'm so terrible at estimating this, maybe a couple hundred people, and then a couple hundred more um, online, you know, in cyberspace, of, I forgot what you call it, um, live streaming. I'm turning to him like to teach live me about streaming. technology. He doesn't, yeah. he doesn't know. I did that to be polite. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, eventually, from the emails, the offer of emails, and the town hall meetings, and then meeting with you know the director level people, um, at least there's the opportunity for input. Whether it happens depends mostly on whether the employees feel that it's safe to criticize and bring things up. And so the core attribute that's necessary for a functioning organization is the feeling of safety in every single employee that he or she can criticize or argue with their supervisor, that they can speak truth to power, and that is easy to say and very, very hard to do. But that's what I've been devoted to trying to do uh, everywhere that I've had a, a leadership position. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it flopped, and sometimes, um, especially in the case with undergrads, they just violently disagree and decide the way to do that is to take over the office, which, you know, it's okay. Sometimes you get a day off that way, so. So we can take over the castle and sleep in it. You've invited both yep. today. Walter, you can take over the castle anytime you, you want. Sleep that means in you, it? Have to, you have to take over Marble. Richard Curran then. Too, exactly. So. Jill, was it you raising your hand? Yeah. Uh, yes, I just wanted to follow up quickly on your comment that you didn't want to over focus on STEM. Mm -hmm. And STEM, of course, is well established. Everybody knows what we mean when we say STEM, but there is also now STEAM. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if. The Smithsonian, in, in your emphasis on not over-focusing on STEM, is going to be willing to push the idea of STEAM, use your considerable persuasive powers to sort of make STEAM as well fixed in the American psyche as STEM. You know, it, it's uh, terrible to admit this uh, in such a broad audience. No, no, I, I know, I know, I, I know quite a bit of what, what STEAM is. No, it's all right. Uh, and, and that is, um, I'm always concerned that we don't. Uh, portray the arts and the humanities as handmaidens to the sciences. Exactly. And so by adding something on to STEM, I think that, you know, if you don't think about it very deeply, obviously you have thought about it deeply, one might think, well, it's important to have the arts because uh, in order to complete thinking about some scientific thing, you have to think about it conceptually or communicatively. There's also this intrinsic value of expressivity and perception that you just, I anyway, can't get any other way. So I've struggled, as silly as this sounds, I've struggled whether it's a good or a bad idea to have STEAM. I was um, uh, very privileged to be on that American Academy of Arts and Sciences writing group that did that uh, report called The Heart of the Matter on uh, the humanities and the social sciences, not so much the arts. And I've had a chance to talk with and learn from people as various as um, Bill Sapphire when he, when he uh, was at Dana <coughs> and uh, many others. Would not happen without very competitive and and uh, and shortcomings but in the in the arts and humanities quite separately from their ability to help us solve problems that you cannot solve by science alone have intrinsic importance in so many ways 
And so when I've uh, talked to members of Congress or written in Huffington Post or Forbes or whatever, had a chance to be interviewed by influential people like, like uh, Walter, I try very hard to give both sides of the discussion. One side of the discussion is that there's practical value in liberal arts education and thinking about these things. Even economically, believe it or not, there's very great data showing the earning potential years later, not right off the bat, of a liberal arts degree. Uh, tomorrow I have the privilege, I'm uh, receiving an award from the, uh, an organization of the colleges of uh, arts and sciences uh, in the United States. And, um, and there's a lot of data that I was refreshing myself on to speak to that august group of deans. But quite separate of that, no matter what the earning potential is, we get a lot of understanding of what we are as humans. I feel so silly saying this in a pedantic way, in ways that have nothing to do with science, that have to do with listening to, well, last night, Walter and I were at an event at which uh, some, some music was sung uh, of a patriotic nature, and uh, both of us got teary-eyed. And we're a couple of hard-bitten old guys, you know, but we got <laughs> teary-eyed, why? Because music has that power has that power. And dance and visual i.edu do it before the design museum. There's a discipline. What, what do you what do you call design? Is it science? Sure it's science. Is it art? Absolutely. Is it psychology? It's definitely learning right now in general. These disciplines are talking about, and I'll answer you by email. Thanks I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just trying to get the mic. Go ahead. Uh, Hold that up close to you. Uh, the Smithsonian Associates. Uh, I was involved with a number of the programs some time ago. I think it's a fabulous program. It's as I understand it, it's your continuing education mm -hmm. here for the, the Washington area. And I just wonder if you have a new vision for it, if you see it moving in new directions. I'll tell you what I've done with the associates so far. I've uh, talked to them a bit. Um, I've, I've joined. I've joined as, as a contributor. And so I'm still in the listening mode on that one. Um, I do think it's very important uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it's a way, as you're inferring, of greatly expanding the access to the Smithsonian. And in a way, it's a way of serving Washington itself. Because I'm a big believer that nonprofits, because we are nonprofits by definition, whatever our status, private universities, whatever, need to also think about serving the community directly to the extent that we can do it. Because the taxpayer giving us nonprofit status is making an enormous, enormous contribution quite separately in other settings of, uh, of the property taxpayers who don't get the credit for that hallowed ground. So um, still in the listening mode on that one, but, uh, but, but I understand it is important for those two reasons. So thanks and congratulations working at the NEH, one of my favorite organizations. And by the way, you can go online and join the Smithsonian Associates, which I would urge people to do. You can go online and put all kinds of money into the Smithsonian. Yeah, but go, <laughs> join the Associates, and that will yeah. be cool. Yeah. Let me get the woman in the back, and then Claudia, you, so that people who miss the seat at the table get to uh, be great. participate. Too. Now, about 20 years ago, I had the pleasure to work on what I think was the first large deaccession that the Smithsonian ever had. The, Charles Bremner Hawk Jackson collection of yes. uh, European arms and armor <coughs> on the Butterfield side, the auction house side. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that you're getting away from the nation's attic model. Have you looked at more deaccessions to refine the collections to save on storage costs and free up money for new collections, for example? There's all kinds of discussion going on about that now. Uh, nothing, thank you very much for the question, nothing conclusive enough to bring to you today. You can imagine the tension um, with a collection that size. On the one hand, it would be great to do what you just talked about. On the other hand, not knowing when something in the collection might be important to a scholar subsequently, there's a certain danger in, in, uh, in deaccessioning too vigorously. So stay, stay tuned. Um, and that's about as evasive an answer as I could give you. <laughs> but on a broader scale, since that's hard for you to yeah. pinpoint, do you think that museums in general, 
which display only a small percentage of what they do, are beginning to do a disservice by not having ways of deaccessioning because that's such a loaded term. Well, that's a loaded question and a loaded term. Um, I, I would say that everything we can do to make our collections more accessible to the public, we should do. And there's many, many paths by which that could be done, of which deaccessioning to someone somewhere else is one, but only one. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to sidestep that one. I think that I do think that because museums are set up in the public trust in general, and because of the nonprofit status, we have to operate that way for real, not just say so. We have to do everything we can to increase access. That's, that's for sure. And I understand, though, that the, that the Smithsonian is a special case. Um, when James Smithson wrote the terms of the bequest of the then very young United States, a place he had never visited, he was a, a British chemist, he said that his idea was the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And the diffusion is what you're talking about the interface with the public, but the increase part, the research part, adds a special twist of complexity because who knows when a researcher in some field is going to want to have to get access to that mm -hmm. thing. It doesn't mean it couldn't be elsewhere and you could get access, but then that complicates it. So there's an enormous amount of scholarly activity in the sciences and the arts and the social sciences, anthropology is going on at this out to James Smithson who was at Pembroke College, Oxford. So Really? Yes. Yeah. I was, uh, Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, um, Claudia. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, a health writer who is also a poet, and I will be sending uh, you some please, poems. Please, please. That will be so <laughs> exciting. I'm going to write down Cl Claudia Gary. And thank please you. send a little bio information, if you would, because what I'm doing is on the left side of the lectern is the poem. On the right side is a little bio. Oh, and we'll you. never know. You can make a lot of stuff up. but wow. just <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, and I also, my, my kids really got a lot out of the Smithsonian when they were growing up. Um, um, I think it's not necessary to really think about how to package combining art and science, just putting it there, just putting the medicine. Well, someone here mentioned uh, uh, it would be good to put more about medicine in the Smithsonian. Um, putting more um, of the arts and sciences uh, next to one another, I think people make the connections. Um, I've noticed in the, in the past year, a few years, there, there are some literary, magazine, literary magazines that have been um, founded at either um, the JAMA, I think, takes poetry. And I just think all of this is a great way to decompartmentalize, decompartmentalize people's thinking. And uh, it just, Amen. you don't have to Amen. come Amen. It's, such a, it's, it's such a good point. In fact, the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, will have a piece of art on the cover and then a description of it, a little tiny, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen that, Richard. It's uh, just fascinating. Yeah. And, uh, and then the, uh, some of the medical journals or scientific journals will have uh, photography you know, competitions and so on. So I, I think it's a very, very good point. I wrote it down and I wrote your name down. Thank Please. you. Thank you. And your poem will be displayed. Wendy. Yep. And your poem. History, how do you, I millions and millions of different things. And it was a fact that actually all of these hugely committed staff people and volunteers are actually having this discussion among themselves. And and it, I, I think it helps enormously in, I'm, we're, I'm from New York, and, and, and at the Cooper Hewitt, there's a huge discussions that have gone on. And if those were revealed to the public, this would be something that well, I think they'd be fascinated it's by. It's such a fascinating idea. You know, one of the big uh, areas that uh, scientists it's agonize over, at least I do, my wife and I talk about it absolutely all the time, is something like what you're talking about, although I wrote it down. It's a very interesting twist, so thank you if I can call you Wendy. That's really interesting. Give me something to... Give me something to talk to my wife about I tonight that's her, fresh. And her Excellency. But you have to call Your Excellency? Yeah. yeah. I wish you'd call more people Your Excellency. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, I think it's fascinating. Um, it brings to mind two, two sort of trains of thought that, that uh, occupy our time. One is this whole issue of communication of complicated matters outside of the canon, so to speak. And that's just as true of the arts or humanities or anthropology as it is in the life or physical sciences. But um, there's a certain amount of the churn that goes on among and between specialists that I don't think people use jargon and get down in the weeds for any exclusionary purpose in general, but because it's a certain efficiency and economy of communication, it does make it much harder for other people to participate and to understand. And then the second uh, set of issues is that 
communication per se is not necessarily a skill that's valued or rewarded when you're going through the training to become a scientist. The skills that are rewarded are the ones, the kind of communication to get a grant sold, that's one kind of communication, it's among specialists. Um, and then there's other kinds. So Alan Alda, you may know, uh, helped start a program at Stony Brook. We had him at Cornell, I had a chance to talk to him on a couple of occasions. And the fact that a SUNY campus, Cornell is also part of the SUNY, uh, organized as part of the SUNY system, uh, would actually have a program, a formal program, bringing in a non-scientist who's a very adept communicator in many ways and very effective at beginning to have people do that. Uh, I want to brag about my wife for a second. When she was at the University of Iowa, she created a course uh, I'm going to get the name of it approximately right, something like survival skills for a research career in which in addition to all of the you know statistics and, and uh, learning about molecular biology and all this stuff, one learned how to be interviewed, how to speak to the media, how to write a review article for a more general audience, things like that. Mm. And um, she also worked at Cornell in a program to te in the veterinary college to teach graduate students how to teach as opposed to teach graduate students how to discover, which is mainly what we teach them. So if we had more of an emphasis, and I want you to call my wife and tell her that I'm talking her up yeah. a little bit, because I sorely need to get some points yeah. on the board and this would really help. Watching you on C-SPAN. Right she's there. probably not actually, she's too busy, but we need to do, and within that, within that universe of ways, and this is a fabulous idea, Richard and I will be talking about this, a very, very interesting idea. Damien? I wanted to ask you... Oh, you're going to ask a question. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, when, you, when you think about the Smithsonian in the, in the frame of the relative lack of interest in learning that is perceived by some in the United mm -hmm. States, that this is not a culture that is that, uh, that interested in learning, do you feel the, the obligation to create the kind of exhibits or special events, the large-scale things that will actually put you know, flags in the map mm -hmm. on, that, on that score? Well, it, it's so interesting that you asked that question. Um, uh, I've been struggling with um, thinking about that uh, uh, in wanting to establish this Youth Advisory Council because the kind of learning that I'm used to dealing with, the currency I'm used to dealing is formal learning that goes along a path to a formal recognition like an undergraduate degree, graduate degree, continuing medical education, whatever, where it's much easier to plot that path because you know the eventual hurdle that has to be jumped over. This is a wholly different thing. Yes. That's, see, the trouble with worse. these live things, yeah. live, digging it deeper, anyway, um, is, is, um, is a much, much bigger task, a much harder task than teaching in a university where people are going there for a specific purpose. Even that purpose, even if that purpose, as in my case, decades ago was to discover what I wanted to do, I didn't know. Um, and it's much harder. So um, I think within that non-answer I just gave you, within that non-answer, it is true that the people who are actually having their sleeves rolled up and, and b building the exhibits and planning the exhibits and deciding how to do them are thinking about this exact question. And again, uh, sorry for the redundancy, the creation of that curious space or the art lab in, in Hirshhorn was an attempt to focus an approach to attraction of interest of a certain demographic. The question is, um, when you're dealing with uh, an institution that attracts and wants to attract literally throughout the life cycle of humanity um, in many parts of the world, um, how do you find something that's general enough? And so what this philosophy has been, understandably, and I think defensively, has been to let a thousand flowers bloom and try a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Just like in the faculty level at a university, they've been, through the creativity of the curators and others who are professionals in those fields, Maybe we could have more feedback on how those things work. I don't know. It's one of the things. That too much feedback, you get back into this Clay Christensen thing. Not enough feedback, and there's a certain arrogance that, that results. And I believe the Smithsonian has adhered to a very good middle course on this, or I wouldn't have been attracted. can always uh, try harder in that regard. So it's a big question, and we're thinking about it a lot. I do think that 
the ability to create a learning culture. No institution better than that little sunrise, and we all love it. We feel comfortable with it. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative to do a couple of quick follow-ups to things that were asked and said, Great. and then we can get... Um, you talked about the importance of design and how it crosses spectrums and how it deals with industry and art and everything else. What is your uh, thoughts at the moment on the arts and industry building? Okay. So um, the arts industry building, in case you're not an aficionado of this, and I'm 16 weeks an aficionado, is um, the second oldest building in the Smithsonian, the oldest being the castle where my office is. And um, arts industry is right next door. Uh, that building, uh, for structural reasons, was closed a while ago. Um, it's been um, uh, repaired and updated and upgraded to the extent now that we could begin to have some events there. So I chose to have my installation in Arts and Industries. And the first floor is more or less done. The upper floors are not done. And on purpose, I liked the environment, Walter, where you're sitting in this sort of gorgeous area. There were maybe, I don't know, 900 people there, something like that. and then. As your gaze wandered, you saw the second and third floors, and they were construction zones, you know, safely away from, from the people. So we're still thinking about what, what to do with that space. And a lot of ideas are being tossed around, and we're nowhere near. <clears throat> it's a fabulous opportunity to do. After January 1st, I believe we are going to have um, millions. Perhaps destroying the seed corn for future. Question. This view with others, perhaps intellectual property is protected, and then it's handed off to the business world where a product or service is developed and then it's marketed and there's progress. And a certain amount of economic development in this country, quite a bit of it, mm -hmm. in the last century was based on that model, and you've written about that. Yeah, I mean, sort of the Vannevar Bush talked about exactly. the linear model where exactly. uh, looking at, say, uh, semiconducting material exactly. science and eventually exactly. Bell Labs makes a transistor. But here's the, uh, here's the hook on that. Here's the rub. So if you take, and I know you have done this because I've seen it in your books, especially in the innovators, mm -hmm. which you can get through Amazon or bookstores <laughs> throughout the, but anyway, um, uh, if, you, if you take something that we consider useful and important now and you carefully retrace the steps of the science okay. that led mm -hmm. and you couldn't predict, well, you better study this particular thing because then you're going to solve some other problem later. It doesn't work that way in science. You have to make an observation for the sake of understanding and then some other mind will figure out how to put them together. So in that, in that regard, it's very important to recognize that a new thing is happening in the American economy in which it's not quite so linear in that fashion. The tech industry, I believe, is a great example of that, where someone can at the same time be developing some concept of programming or development in the tech sector that a is developing. So that's an argument for two basic science without having to hang a burden on it to say we're only going to support it if it's obvious how it could be turned into either national security or economic development. We have to have the confidence in the process that has made the United States the envy of the world in higher education and in science in general to let people follow their nose in terms of good ideas. At the same time, at the same time it's very understandable in a, in a constrained environment in terms of revenue increases that the scientists are feeling put upon right now. And why are they put upon? They're put upon for two reasons. One is that the inflation rate of doing science is not the same market basket of goods and services that define the CPI. It's different. There's a higher education price index. There's other indices that have to do with what sort of buildings and infrastructure you need to do physical science research that has to be vibration free or health science research. And so it is true that, it's, that we're not keeping up with inflation and therefore we're missing opportunities. I don't know what the opportunities are, but we're going to miss opportunities. But the second is that we've trained a lot of PhDs, a lot of PhDs in this country. And you can look at the statistics for how many of those PhDs are able to get full bore academic positions, and most of them are not. Right. Most of them are not. Now I hope to attract some of them to the Smithsonian as another alternative. 
But the fact is there's been some imbalance. We've produced a lot of PhD level people, terminal degrees, and because of the funding constraints, we haven't kept up with the opportunities. So that's a dilemma that we have to think about carefully in this country. It touches on immigration reform. It touches on a lot of other issues that we don't have time to talk about today. About the Smithsonian, it is true that, as I mentioned, we focus on the diffusion part and not the increase of knowledge. There's areas I had no idea even existed as a Smithsonian. I knew they existed, but didn't know the connection. And I went to visit uh, uh, Cambridge. I was uh, at a, giving a, a very brief uh, panel at Harvard, and the next day, Elsewhere in Cambridge went to um, went to visit it. It's unbelievable. The Astrophysics Observatory this is the in Cambridge, Smithsonian Mass. Astrophysics Observatory, in, and not only in Cambridge, Mass. It runs ground-based observatories in Arizona mm. and elsewhere. It runs a we run the Chandra X-ray mm -hmm. Observatory out in space. It's unbelievable, and um, that's all a, a fabulous interaction between mm. Harvard and the Smithsonian. Hundreds of scientists figuring out things. And I'll tell you the thing that excited me the most. I'm sort of a science fiction geek. Mm -hmm. I told you about the telescope thing. I used to have a subscription to a magazine called uh, Analog. It's called Analog Science Fact mm -hmm. Science Fiction. I'm not sure if it's still being published, mm -hmm. but I used to really enjoy mm -hmm. it. And uh, maybe that's one of the few things you didn't write or edit. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, but I found out from a couple of the scientists there, and uh, 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 you probably know this, but just to be sure, um, there's a, an instrument that we're all working to develop, a bunch of institutions, over 10, called the Giant Magellan Telescope. Right. It'll be an 82-foot uh, uh, mm -hmm. telescope, diameter telescope. And there's an instrument that they're developing at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. The attempt is to identify oxygen in the environment of a far-off heavenly body. Mm -hmm. And that is a sign of life, oxygen get our oxygen, as you know, from plant life and so on. And so I have to tell you, I, I was just giddy about the fact that some people who are part of the Smithsonian are working on an instrument to look for evidence of extraterrestrial uh, life. Just amazing. I never would have thought about that as something the Smithsonian Institution does. But there's many, many examples like that that I'm still learning almost every day. Well, that's why I wanted to get a plug in it's for good. that, because it's not just the pandas, but the astrophysics. And it Nothing is, wrong with pandas. I mean. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you're pandering to the pandas now, but that's all right. Um, but uh, to put it, and I'll end by, if I may, just a little putting it into the context, because the Astrophysics Observatory to me is astonishing, something that the United States really needs to do along with the Magellan. But it was um, to talk about how basic science is not necessarily linear, but it's beautiful. Yeah. It, it was exactly 100 years ago this week that Albert Einstein went to the Prussian Academy and gave his first lecture mm. explaining general relativity. Huh. And it was just pure science for the sake of science. It wasn't a Bell Lab saying we need to amplify a phone signal. It was just how does space and time curve and thus create gravity. I mean, it's an awesomely beautiful thing. And it's been a hundred years but now when I pull out my iPhone and my daughter's going to be traveling to Mexico and we say, okay, let's share locations like that, I think of everything from GPS to lasers to microchips to uh, how uh, electrons dance on the surface of a solid state material that comes from the quantum mechanics, all coming out of what Einstein did just pacing there in the Prussian Academy a hundred years ago. And we need to nurture that in our society, and the place that nurtures it best in all of its aspects is the Smithsonian. So it's just wonderful to us in Washington and those who love the Smithsonian that you've come down. You're bringing to it. We always love to learn something new about somebody. I had known about your medical imaging and how you treat teenagers with um, congenital heart. What I never knew is that you were a DJ and flute player at a Latin jazz show on the radio in Iowa City. Just, just it, wasn't, well, it wasn't playing on the radio. If I played on the radio, it would have had no listeners whatsoever. Oh. I just put the CDs on, and uh, my son and, uh, and the daughter-in-law, when they were uh, dating, used to come to the studio Sunday nights, and we were alone in the studio. And I would say, what does the youth of America think of this new cut? And they would just sit there, and they wouldn't say anything, or they'd clap or anything. I'd say, don't be silent. They call that dead air. People will change the channel. And I said, let's try it again. What does the youth of America think? 
Nothing. Just zero. Just zero. <laughs> Thanks, Walter. Thank you, David. You're excellent.